towards your other monitor, like where it's yeah, like centralized. Centralized, yeah. You go stand. Yeah. And Thank you. Do you want some of the lights a little darker so you can yeah, see the presentation? Yeah. yeah. Do you want me to take any more out? Um, That's probably good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay. okay. So. Can you see my face, though? No. no. It's a little dark for your face, yeah. so we can turn on the front. Like that? No. no to see your face We're a little more clear, you'll want the front fluorescence. Yeah, front fluorescence, these two, right? Sorry. No. And then off with the other one. Yep. Yeah. yeah. There, now we yep. can see your face more clearly. Yep, because that's sure. the one I think that we had the way that we had it last time. Mm -hmm. And then, there we go. Yep. It almost looks like it's at an angle. It, it does look like a skeleton. Let me just go. Sometimes the people like to be funny and that's what they think. Does that look more level or did I put it the other way? I think it. I don't know. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pull it. <laughs> Ever slightly. Yeah, it's a little cockeyed, right? Yeah. <laughs> the the men here feel <laughs> like OCD. <laughs> I I absolutely am, yeah. especially if it's something like for my business or my customers. I'll be crazy about it. Okay. All right. So welcome to our business planning seminar, and today we're going to be talking about. <clears throat> legal and insurance and financial and tax consequences and tax impacts that every business owner should know about. We have a wonderful guest speaker today, Michael Pile. 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 <laughs> I swear he needs an accent mark on the E. Um, and Michael's going to be covering the financial aspect of this presentation. And so we really look forward to that. We're gonna break down our presentation into four sections. So I'll be doing the first two on legal and insurance aspects that um, every business owner should know. Then we'll break over to Michael's presentation on the financial aspects, and then we'll come back to me to go over taxes in the end, all right? So without further ado, let's talk about what the law, insurance, and taxes, uh, have to do with your business and why they can make and break your business. So let me gather my little thing here. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna talk about, if it's working, I was working just now earlier. Justin, I might have, you have to do this thing. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so the biggest mistakes that business owners make. Okay, and I want to start out with legal mistakes, right? So these are all based on conversations that I regularly have with my clients when they come in. They, uh, they are interested in creating a business or expanding their business. They're mostly real estate investors, but I do get um, clients that come from other areas. And the first thing that they say is, I want to create an LLC <laughs> and they're, you know, they're not sure what an LLC means, but they, they come in with that inspiration of creating an LLC. And so the first biggest mistake that an, a real estate or business person can make when it comes to their business is just equating having an LLC with not being sued. The second uh, biggest mistake that business owners make is they start bringing in partners into their business without any clarity about their roles or what those partners are going to be doing, how much influence each is going to have. So we're going to be discussing that. That's the second biggest mistake. Number three, they um, want 
massive amounts of control, business owners, at the expense of growth. So we're going to be talking about that. And, and you might be thinking, how is this a legal aspect? But I'll go over that right now. I'm just going over the bullets of these different factors. Uh, the next biggest mistake that is made is that the business owner doesn't have any written standards for um, their staff or their contractors. They are just going at, by the seat of their pants in terms of when they're bringing people in to work with them, whether they're actually employees or they're independent contractors. The next biggest mistake we're going to cover is mixing business and personal funds. This is a big one. This can uh, destroy liability, things like that. And so we're going to discuss that. And then finally, as far as legal mistakes, um, not preparing for incapacitation and death. Business owners, as the majority of human beings, tend to consider themselves immortal. So we're going to talk about the risks and the impact that it has on your business to not have a plan in place if something happens to you as a business owner. <clears throat> All right. The next section that I'm going to cover, and I'm just going to very quickly do the bullet point for taxes because that will be covered at the end, but I do want to go over our bullets for insurance, right? So insurance mistakes made by business owners. Number one, you decide to go with the cheapest insurance that you find rather than the one that actually gives you the protection that your business needs. And this goes for all kinds of different insurance. Um, Two, not knowing about what coverage you actually need for the type of business that you have. That's big, you know? Uh, you need to understand if you have a certain amount of employees, a certain area of business, what you need to operate legally. Next, not developing a relationship with your business broker. Don't know how many people come up to me and say, I don't have a business broker. I don't have an insurance broker. I haven't had those kinds of conversations. So that's a big mistake. Next, uh, not using insurance to make it an incentive for employees. There's lots of different insurances out there and they can help you attract the best kind of people to work for you. So that's a mistake. It's a missed opportunity. And finally, not using it to protect yourself from incapacitation and death, right? There's those areas. And I'm not bringing this up as if I sold insurance because I don't, but I think that it's really important as a business owner to have a number of advisors, uh, mentors, right? From the different areas that we're gonna cover today to help you understand what you need when you need it, how it's going to make your business more successful, and how it's going to make you more competitive in terms of attracting the right kind of people to work for you. As far as taxes go, um, there's there's about, I don't want to say six, no, seven bullets that I'm going to cover. And I'm going to look at my paper here because I have a bit of a cold and I did have to take medicine today. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, doing your own bookkeeping, that's a big mistake. Uh, not examining your financial statements. This is something that business owners, uh, they're kind of scared to look at their finances, right? So that's something we're going to cover in taxes. Uh, not paying your estimated taxes. Ooh, those big surprise bills at the end. <laughs> um, not meeting with your CPA quarterly. You really should be meeting with a CPA who focuses on business taxes and understands business taxes, and you need to be meeting with them regularly. Um, going with a default filing status or tax status, right? So when you create a company and you decide, I'm just, I'm just creating this, like whatever the default is, I'm not even bothered to consider tax consequences, you're missing out. You might be creating a much bigger tax bill for yourself than you think by just leaving it by the default. Um, ignoring deductions. That's another big area where you're, you can be making huge mistakes as a business owners and be actually creating big tax liabilities for yourself that are not necessary. And then ignoring death and gift taxes as a business owner. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the gift aspect in terms of what I've seen lots of smaller business owners do, which is they say, 
oh, I, well, I have three companies and, you know, I'm just going to transfer this property over to this other company and transfer this other, pro and they don't account for the differences in value. Now you're triggering these potential gift consequences into the mix. So those are our little bullets for what we're going to um, go over. And let's talk about legal, right? Ooh, my little clicker works now, presumptively. So <laughs> legal, right? What can make or break your business? So first, let's go over these missed opportunities. I'm going to call all of these missed opportunities because mistakes really are missed opportunities. You can see it as a challenge, but if you are not doing these things, your business, it could potentially shrink. Uh, you could grow at a much slower rate. You could attract the wrong people into your business. You could attract the wrong investors into your business. Whereas if you're doing the right things and you take the time to implement these things, you're going to create excellent opportunities for your business. So mistake number one, right? I mentioned it, equating an LLC with not getting sued. <laughs> the statement that I get all the time, I just want to set up an LLC. <laughs> so when we have meetings with clients, when I sit down with a client, uh, you know, I ask, why? Has anybody asked you that? Why? What is your concern or like maybe what's triggering the thought that you should be creating an LLC and as opposed to what, right? What do you have right now? Why an LLC? Why not a corporation? What's your goal with your business? You know, those are all questions you should be thinking about before going into this an LLC as it's, a, it's an end all be all, right? Because the reality is, does having an entity actually stop lawsuits? <laughs> no. <laughs> having an entity is not going to stop somebody from suing your business. What it is, if it's done correctly, is it's going to limit the ability of a successful litigant, so a person who successfully sues you, from going after your personal assets. It's going to limit what they can capture to your business assets. So that's really important to understand. It doesn't just stop lawsuits. It doesn't dissuade people from suing. People will sue. This is America. <laughs> um, but I did want to talk about, well, like, what are some of the real benefits that are involved in having an entity, right? Well, first, if you have an entity as opposed to just doing something like a DBA or, you know, it's going to get treated with more respect, more professionalism. It's going to be taken more seriously in the eyes of the consumer community to have a legal entity that distinguishes you from the business that you're running. So that's one of the real benefits. Second benefit is that it allows you to have potential tax benefits and reduce your tax liability if in that entity you select a tax structure that will reduce your tax burden at the end of the year. <clears throat> and then other real benefits are, like I said, if you run it properly, it's going to limit a potential litigant's ability to go after your personal assets. It's going to limit that to the assets of the entity, but only if you do things right. So this is something that we discuss when we're having our, me our meetings with our clients who want to do business planning. But it's something that I want you to think about, right? Because it's missed opportunities when you just go... I just want to create an LLC. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the second missed opportunity. <clears throat> when people bring in partners into the business without clarity, and what do I mean by that? Well, here's another statement that I get all the time when I'm having conversations with clients. I have a friend or I have a family, I have an uncle, you know, right? They're going to lend me the money to get this business running. And Immediately, as an attorney, my spidey sense starts to go, ooh, right? <laughs> because what kind of clarity do you have with this person about their role? Are they actually lending you money where you've signed a note and you've got interest and you're going to be making payments? And the vast majority of people realize they don't have this in place, right? 
Or are these family members thinking, no, I get to have some ownership stake in the business as a result of putting in money. So getting that clarity of roles is really important because the majority of business disputes arise from these initial stages where you haven't made um, a clear point by point thing of what each person's role is. So really you need to you need to think about you know what are you contributing to this entity? What are they putting into this entity? Is it really a loan? Are they act are they participating in the business? Are they going to have any control, any say over any particular area? Are they going to be putting in some time, like physically working in the business, even if it's just answering phone calls? Those roles need to be clearly stated before you bring in partners, right? Because the default is when you start having a running a business, you, this is even before you, you create an entity, right? But if you start doing business together with somebody else, you've created a default partnership. <laughs> you've triggered partnership taxations. You've triggered liability issues. You've triggered all these other things if you don't really have clarity in places to how far this other person is actually part of your business. <clears throat> so when I say, what's the default, right? Like, what is the default? Does the default, like I said, is if you and somebody else, two or more people participating in a business endeavor together, you've got a partnership where the actions that these other people take on behalf of your business also bind you and also create liability in you. So this is why it's essential to have this clarity and have it written down, <laughs> an agreement, a real agreement that governs the transaction and the respective roles. The next missed opportunity or legal mistake that I see a lot of business owners make is that they say they want control at the expense of growth, right? So another thing I hear all the time, I have to do everything myself. Part of this is the belief, and it's a false belief, that we can do everything better than everybody else because we feel like we know our business. But here's the thing. You only have a limited amount of time every week to work on your business, right? You've got 168 hours in a week, 50 to 56 of those, you're going to be sleeping. You're going to need to devote some of your time for your family, right? Probably some for some sort of relaxation and then the rest of it to your business. So you're limited in what you can actually do for your business on your own. So in order to be able to grow, you need to be able to let go of some of that need for control. And that requires you sitting down and identifying, okay, what am I really good at in my business? And what am I going to have to let go of and delegate? Because other people can probably do it better than me. That is what allows businesses to grow. The understanding that you can't do everything yourself because there'll be a cap. There's just a time cap. I mean, you cannot add more time without buying time. And how do you buy time? You hire people to work for you. They're either direct employees or maybe independent contractors, people that you start, you know, delegating certain tasks to. But that is a missed opportunity. And some of this arises also from like the fear of, of hiring. You might think, I don't have enough to pay myself. How do I have enough to pay another person? Right, the payroll fear, because people start thinking, oh God, like another employee that's starting out, that's maybe 40, 60, however many thousand dollars a year. And you start thinking of that number is what you need, but that's not what you need. You need that first month salary. If you hire the right person, they'll pay for themselves very quickly. You'll get a return on your investment. So that need for control can create legal issues for you. And here's why, because by the time that you realize if, if you've been focused on control and only I can do this, by the time that you need to add somebody because you are up here and you are at your max, that procrastination is gonna result in you hiring in a rush without a plan and hiring the wrong people. 
And the wrong people can destroy your business. The wrong people can ruin your reputation with your clients. The wrong people can ruin the kind of services that you provide. And all of this because you waited until the very last minute. You didn't plan it out. You didn't think about it before you needed it. Before you really, truly, absolutely, desperately needed it. So let's talk about our next missed opportunity. <clears throat> All right. So this is, this kind of relates to that, right? Because a lot of legal issues arise in terms of hiring, who you bring in, right? So not having written standards for your staff and contractors can create a lot of legal issues for you as a business owner. Here's another statement that I get all the time. Oh, my staff knows to ask me about, you know, taking time off, or my staff knows to ask me about how to do this job thing, or my staff knows to ask me about vacation or whatever it might be, right? Well, first of all, think of it this way. Do you really want to be constantly interrupted with these kinds of questions? How much of your time as a business owner is that taking away from you not having a written policy in place for this? So that's number one. And then think about how the perception of favorites in the office, even if you don't have any favoritism, let's just say somebody's always the brave one that's willing to ask for time off. And your policy mentally up here might be the same for everybody, but there's only one person willing to ask for time off. Now the rest of your team's gonna perceive them as being the favorite because you gave them the time off. And this is just because that person was the only one who bothered to ask, right? The perception of favoritism can create very angry employees. And these employees that are dissatisfied can end up ruining the reputation of your business, right? Bad mouthing you to the community, maybe starting to behave not so nicely with your clients, with your customers. And so it's really important for that reason to have written policies like this in place. Other things that you need to consider when you or like that are missed opportunities, right? When you don't have written standards for staff or for contractors is the work they're creating. Does this work belong to them or does it belong to you? Well, if it's work, that you've assigned an employee generally under the law, this is gonna be work that belongs to the company. But if it's an independent contractor, say you've, you've hired an independent contractor to design a logo for you and you don't sign a work for hire agreement, guess what? That's their copyright. <laughs> so think about it. Do you have these agreements in place? Are you entering into the right written agreements with contractors to make sure that what you're hiring them to do is truly a work for hire, something they're creating for you and not something that they can just run off with? <clears throat> Other considerations when you don't have written standards. Can your employee take your clients and go elsewhere? Well, if you don't have something that is written that prohibits them from doing this, then yes, they can. <laughs> what about taking your team members away? Can an employee become a former employee, start his own business and take your team members away? And the answer is yes, unless you've got a written agreement that says that they can't. They could take your best people if you don't have these things in place. So that's a consequence of not having written standards for your team members and your contractors, because you can also put this into contractor agreements. You're not allowed to take my staff. You know, you're not allowed to take my clients. Certain industries have limitations, like, for example, attorneys, we are not permitted to prohibit other attorneys from taking clients because this is the client's right to go wherever they want to go. But this isn't how it works for the majority of industries. There is freedom in poaching clients for every other industry out there, unless you've got a written agreement. <clears throat> and then other things that you need to be clear on is what are some of the bases for getting fired, right? This accountability for your employees and for your contractors is important. What are your standards? 
What are you going to tolerate? What are your expectations? That needs to be in writing. It, it makes it a safer place for everybody involved to do that. Um, basis for promotions, right? What do they need to do in terms of like absences? How many absences is too much? How much can the business bear? If you don't have any of this in writing, you're putting your business at risk. <clears throat> So next opportunity that is missed is um, mixing business. Oh, I think I passed I it. Yeah, there you go. Did you, did you move it? I switched it. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Mixing business and personal funds. So this would happen all the time when I was president of a title company. People would go and they would put down their earnest money deposit for their house, for their second house, with a check from their company, or vice versa. They would pay for business expenses with their personal card, with a personal check. And now you've got all these commingled, commingled funds, right? What you're doing when you do that as a business owner is that you're diluting the separation between the entity and yourself, and you're creating wonderful loopholes for any litigator to go, this isn't a real entity. They're not taking it seriously. We should be able to pierce it to get at their personal assets to satisfy our judgment. So that's a big no-no, right? But not only does it create challenges in terms of the legal liability protection that having an entity is supposed to create for you, but it's also gonna create challenges for deductibility purposes of your business expenses. Is this a business expense? Wait a second, you've got a $3,000 check that's coming from your business account, but it went to put money down on your house. Oh, you're gonna create a nightmare for your bookkeeper if you have one, right? For yourself if you don't, and you're definitely gonna create these lovely little red flags for an IRS auditor to go, whoa, I don't like this. So it is, definitely a concern and it is a high risk type of activity that I see way too many small business owners make. The other part is that it can affect the basis in your business, right? So you've got a certain amount that you've put into your business. That's your basis as, a, as an owner. And from there, that helps your accountant that you should have, right? determine, okay, from here to here, that's the gain, that's the profit, and then your basis goes up and down every year, depending on that. So it can impact it based on what you're putting in or taking out with the commingling of your personal assets. So think about that. <clears throat> and then the other part is that it's gonna affect your relationship with partners if you've got more than one owner in the business. Because if you are using your personal credit card to buy things from the business, et cetera. How is your partner going to know that what you're saying you spent on this is really a business expense and not a personal expense when you use your credit card, your personal credit card to pay for these things? It's just inviting arguments that turn into attorney letters that turn into lawsuits. So commingling is a down one, like downward spiral when it comes to these things, and that's why it's a legal mistake. All right, so next, we're going to go to the last one that I want to address, and that's not preparing for incapacitation and death. Too many times I get the statement from business owner, I'm young, I'm healthy, you know, it's too early for me to start thinking about an estate plan, but I don't care, you're a 25-year-old business owner. You've developed assets. You've now got something that's going to get litigated in probate court if you don't do something about it and somebody runs you over, hits you with their car or truck, or you happen to have an early stroke, you have an undiagnosed heart condition, whatever it might be. You're at risk because you're living, breathing like the rest of us and all of us are mortal. And so not preparing for incapacitation and death is just creating these big problems, these 
big potential costly legal disputes, particularly if you're a business owner, because what's one of the biggest expenses in probate administration or guardianship administration when it comes to a person who died that owned a business? It's the valuation of a business. Now you have to have accountants involved, right? People that come in, business valuators that have to get hired to determine what was the value of this business that this person who passed away left behind. And there's competing versions on how to evaluate a business. So if you didn't write down in your operating documents of your entity how your business should be valued if something happened to you, you're going to have competing things. And what does competing things mean? It means more litigation. It means this person's going to want to go with this one. This person's going to want to go with this one, right? Some people might want to get a high valuation. Some people might want to get a low valuation, right? Because depending on what that business value is, it might have different tax consequences for the estate. And so not having it planned, not having a business succession as part of your estate plan, not having discussed those things and putting those things in place is really gonna create a terrible mess. And then just think about the managing part of your business. If you become incapacitated and you own a business right now and you have a plan, who can run your things? Who can step in and have that communication with your clients to say, Hey, you know, like this person's, you know, he, he had a stroke, he's hospitalized right now where he's working on physical therapy, et cetera, but he can't talk right now. So here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to, you know, get a hold of our suppliers, et cetera, to make sure that you're taken care of, or even just here's who can handle this for you right now. This other business that also does this, et cetera, to protect your business reputation while you're getting better. Right, because incapacitation isn't just oh now you know an old man that developed dementia. Incapacitation can be, I got hit by a car. I'm in the hospital for three months. Incapacitation can be, I had a stroke. I need, I'm all here, but I need six months of physical therapy to be able to speak again. Right. So all of these things. If you leave it blank, if you don't have a plan, then you're gonna go with the state's plan because the state does have a plan for you. Every single one of you that doesn't have a chosen written estate plan and business succession plan, every state has a plan for you. Wherever you have assets, that state has a plan for you. And that plan of the state involves litigation, whether you are incapacitated or deceased. It's either probate litigation, or guardianship litigation. And they're both very costly and very time consuming. Guardianship litigation you're looking at, if you're lucky, two to three months to get a guardian in place. And in Florida, you're looking at having an attorney for you, an attorney for the person that's petitioning to be a guardian, three different experts that need to be appointed by the court, to determine the degree of your need for a guardian, the judge, and all of their attorney's fees. So think about the cost of that versus having designations in your operating documents and having designations in a power of attorney and things like that. And then probate can take years. The more assets that you own and the more complex your assets are, which small businesses are complex, they just are by their nature, the longer it's going to take. So imagine the impact that has on your family, on your employees, if you've got employees, right? All these people that depend on you as a business owner, the impact of not having an estate plan. So that is the legal aspect, right? Legal mistakes that are made, very common mistakes made by business owners. And I wanna make you highly aware of that. <clears throat> Now I'm gonna go over insurance. Insurance, right? It's there to help you if you do it right. <laughs> and so, so these are some of the insurance mistakes made by business owners. And I'm not an insurance broker. I don't sell insurance, but these are things that I catch when I have those conversations with my clients at business meetings. So going for cheap instead of being protected, right? This is another statement I hear in my consults. 
I got this great deal of insurance. I'm only paying $700 this year. Okay, $700 as opposed to what and for what? What did you get, right? That's important. What does it cover? Oh, I don't know. It was just the lowest amount. <laughs> okay. What's your deductible? How's that going to impact you perhaps becoming cash strapped in your business, right? Because it tends to be that the lower the premium, the higher the deductible that you have to pay. And then, okay, great. Tell me more about this company. How easy is it for you to file a claim with this company? What kind of responsiveness are you going to get? Are you dealing with a human being? Are you dealing with a computer? Do you have somebody that you know you could call? You're going to be dealing with the same person over and over, and they know your business, and they know what you need, and they have given you updates on here's what you need to organize to get together, or are you kind of just left in the cold trying to figure out what on earth you need to submit in order to file a successful claim? And then how easy is it to get paid? What's this? insurance company's reputation in terms of paying for a claim. How long does it take to get paid on a claim, right? These are all things you should be considering as business owners. And these are insurance mistakes that are made. And what about the type of insurance, right? So let's go to the next section of not knowing about necessary coverage for your industry. So necessary coverage for your industry is referring to, you know, like if you have a, um, if you're a contractor, you're gonna need certain coverage. That's gonna be very different from having a business where you're sitting in an office and you've got paperwork and let's say you are, a management company for rentals, right? That's going to require different kinds of coverage than somebody who's out there repairing roofs or installing roofs. But some people go into these businesses and they have this beautiful idea and they fail to recognize that they need specific coverage because they go, I don't need this. I know how to do my job safely. <laughs> it's this false idea that we give ourselves that we have control over everything that's going on around us, but we don't, right? We don't have control over the condition of the roof that might result in one of our employees or contractors slipping and falling, right? We don't have control over a customer's particular satisfaction or dissatisfaction that's going to cause them to file a claim because they didn't like how Stephanie said their name, you know? And so it's important to think about the kind of coverage that you should be having in your industry as a result of the fact that you don't have control over anyone outside of yourself. So things that you should consider, right? Do I have coverage for my tools, for my equipment? Do I have coverage for my vehicles if the type of business that I'm in requires me to have vehicles, right? Do I require my independent contractors to have insurance over those things? Something as simple as being a real estate investor where you've got runners that you kind of contract out, you, you pay them to go check up on your property, to go take pictures, et cetera. Are you requiring these people to have insurance coverage? Because they're out there doing a job for you when they're going to take pictures and by the laws of agency, you can get sued for having sent somebody to do that job and having that person run into another car while they were doing that job. So you wanna make sure that they're covered, right? Cause insurance is that first line of putting the money there for that claim to satisfy that claim so that your assets don't get touched, right? And then in this present era, have you had a discussion with an insurance advisor about having coverage for your data? Most of us are keeping our information now in the cloud, right? Some sort of cloud service, or we might have servers. Do you have coverage for that? Do you have protection for that? Do you have coverage for cyber terrorism or for cyber theft? If you're managing money coming in and going out, right? You need to make sure that you have considered sufficient coverage 
for the potential for that happening. This is big for realtors, big, because sometimes they're the party that's handling deposits, right? They're not necessarily handling the big funds coming in and the big funds going out, but sometimes realtors hold the earnest money deposits and that subjects them and makes them targets to cyber terrorism. Their accounts get spoofed all the time. I saw this very frequently when I was president of a title company. These realtor accounts get hacked daily. So think about the kind of coverage that you might need as a result of the way in which we're doing business now. We're becoming more and more virtual. That's important. <clears throat> All right. Another mistake, right? Not developing a relationship with your insurance broker. Okay. All right. So another statement that I get is, I don't have an insurance broker or I don't have a insurance agent that I speak with regularly. I don't, I don't know anybody, right? Now, my job as a counselor is to help them connect with somebody that can, they can develop those relationships with, right? Because ideally, you have that kind of a relationship, just like you have that kind of a relationship with your, with your business lender. You have that kind of a relationship with your CPA. You have that kind of a relationship with your business lawyer. You have that kind of a relationship with your insurance agent for the same reason, because this person needs to get to know your business so that they understand your needs, so that they understand what kind of coverage risks might come up, right? If they don't know anything about your business, then how are they gonna know how to best protect you? And if you don't know anything about the industry, how are you going to prepare yourself for claims, for changes in rates, for new coverage opportunities, for new risks that arise, right? One of the things that I find uh, pretty pretty nice in, in the group, um, and this is how I, how I know Michael, Michael and I are in the same <clears throat> networking group. One of our, members is an insurance agent and he teaches us about changes that are taking place in the insurance industry without that kind of a relationship with somebody for your business how do you know right how do you know to plan that oh god rates are going up for this kind of thing i need to cushion so that i have the money to pay for my insurance in three months when it's due or in six months when it's due right so Relationship development is important. <clears throat> All right, so insurance mistake continued. Not using insurance to attract the right team members. Another statement that I hear is, oh, I don't offer any benefits or I don't think I can afford to offer any benefits. But here's the thing, employees and just like everybody in the world, like people are far better informed as, as far as what kind of expectations they should have about working for a company, working for a business, right? And so you need to incentivize your employees to stay. And one of the easiest ways that you can incentivize employees to stay is, is by providing some sort of insurance coverage benefits. And it doesn't have to be overwhelmingly expensive for your business. You might start out just offering life and accidental insurance coverage. But that might make the difference between them working for your competitor or working for you. And if you wanna attract the best talent, make it available, right? Because the cost of training somebody new of high turnover is a lot more than the cost of providing these benefits. Think about the amount of time it takes to train a new employee. This is a significant amount of time, right? So you might not be able to offer health insurance coverage from the very beginning, but you can start out with offering life, accident, dental, vision kind of coverage. That's still going to make you more competitive over the other business owner that's not even thought about the consequences of having to deal with high turnover rates in their business. And then all of these benefits are tax deductible. So it's another great way to reduce your tax bill at the end of the year. Oop. 
What happened there? There we go. <laughs> that was weird. Okay. Uh, and then finally, not using it to um, protect from incapacitation or death. So not using insurance for the same reason, right? This is a big mistake that owners make. They, you know, they sometimes they say it in a funny way. They're like, well, I guess I just won't die. I can't die. I can't become incapacitated. But the reality is you can't stop that from happening. We are living creatures and we're all going to die. And so... <laughs> You are the key to your business, and so you need to protect yourself, and you can use your business to protect yourself, right? You can use your business to fund your health insurance, your dental insurance, your vision insurance. Now, your business as a business owner can't pay for your life insurance. It's not a deductible expense, but it can for the other ones. But let's say you've got amazing managers on your team. And you know that it would take more than three months to properly train and find somebody that's going to be the same quality of replacement. And so key man insurance is something to think about, right? Coverage so that if something happens to them, they're in an accident or they pass away or whatever the reason might be, right? You've got a policy that's going to pay the business to be able to find a replacement, somebody that can be there, train them so that you are not cash strapped in doing all of this process of replacing a key man, a key manager position kind of a thing, because there is a difference between the time it takes to train somebody that's gonna do clerical work and the time that it takes to train somebody that's gotta supervise 10 people, right? It's quite a difference. And so not using insurance as part of planning for these things that will happen <laughs> is a missed opportunity for your business. All right, so that is the first part of my presentation. I want to introduce Michael now because Michael is going to be talking about our financial side of the business. And Michael's company is Storehouse Capital. Um, I love the reason why he gave for the name. He said, you know, he's, he's a man of faith. And storehouse is a place where you go and you've got your resources. And so he wants to be a resource for his clients. Not, it's not just lending. It is being a resource for all of the aspects that come up for business owners. And so without further ado, I'm going to have Michael come up and we're going to do a little screen switch for the presentation. Wow, thank you, Natalia, for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Michael Pillay. Uh, I own Storehouse Capital Funding Solutions. I started it in 2017. Uh, it was uh, pretty weird. I came home. I was frustrated from where I was at. And I told my wife, I quit my job. <laughs> don't, don't try that. Um, I told my wife, I quit my job. And um, I literally uh, talked to my brother who was in, in the legal space a little bit, and he pointed me to the right direction uh, to form an LLC, uh, which I got to get checked by you after all that info, uh, make sure I'm covered correctly. And um, after uh, getting the LLC, I started to connect with uh, different lenders and learn a lot of different products. But before all that, I was in the lending space since about 2004. Um, I was uh, a mortgage loan officer around the age of about 20. Uh, and uh, from the year 2004, 2008, I worked for a mortgage company. And uh, I'm pretty sure uh, many remember in 2008, the wonderful crash that happened, uh, which allowed me to kind of shift careers a little bit, still in the financial industry to get into banking. Um, got into banking, loved it. I worked as a branch manager over in Comac, New York. Uh, for about, um, say, five or six years before I kind of got right back into lending. And uh, when I got back into lending, that's when I kind of got into the space to learn a little bit, little bit more about the commercial lending space versus the personal lending space. And um, uh, it, it was quite a, a, a very strong market for it. Uh, but I was still learning in the process, especially when I was at, as a, uh, as a working as a branch manager at the bank. Uh, they did commercial mortgages there, which intrigued me to get back into lending. So uh, I moved to from, from New York to Florida in 2020. 
before we knew before uh, it, it was quite frightening before we knew the pandemic would would, would strike uh, it, when everything and the lockdown begins to happen and things of that nature in New York um, in New York about I say about April or so uh, we started contemplating and say you know is this is this a good move should we get a deposit back from what we put down on some real estate uh, it was a little nerve wracking but nevertheless we're here. Uh, I'm happy to be in Tampa, Florida. It is a pleasure uh, to be here after being in New York for 36 or some odd years. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to be here in front of you guys. So uh, I kind of want to get to it. Uh, let's see. Funding and financing. Uh, so we're going to talk money. We're going to talk money. We're going to talk lending. We're going to talk about why lending is important. And we're going to have a couple of key topics we're going to talk about as well. So... Sure. For some reason. Blanked out. Okay. Okay, it looks good. Oh, screen is down. Okay, that works okay. So we're back up. All right. So the opportunity for financing. What's happening today? All right. So uh, there's a lot of flexible financing programs, programs with some low down payments, uh, some awesome things happening in the market today, especially for investors. And I just want to clarify that um, uh, this is, uh, although it is mortgages, um, we're going to be talking more on the business side of mortgages, more for investors, uh, more for more towards business owners and individuals that are aspiring to get into this real estate market for investments. So uh, first we're going to talk about uh, is uh, some of the SBA products that are available on the market. Some of the SBA products that are available in the market come with minimum down payments. We're talking about 10% equity injection. Um, and equity injection is just a fancy word for down payment. Okay. So uh, we're talking about the SBA uh, do, uh, giving programs out up to 90% financing. So you're talking about maybe 10% on the table. So every 100,000 you want to borrow, you figure you might want to put down about $10,000 or so. Now, um, uh, the next product we're going to talk about is also the one to four family investment properties, uh, Airbnbs. And take a look at that in the, uh, in the parentheses there. You could do a 15% down on a no documentation in Florida and Texas. Wow. That is, with a 740 FICO, of course, of course, they want good credibility. But nevertheless, um, with the 740 FICO, you're able to get these uh, a, a, a nice, get your hands on a nice piece of property there uh, with a minimal amount down, just to kind of give you perspective. Um, although it's 15% down, uh, and it's a no doc, they want us to see a little bit of skin in the game. So some people can say uh, that is too good to be true. What does a no doc mean? Well, a no doc means that you don't have to provide your income uh, to actually obtain the properties. So uh, again, how is that? It's still kind of too good to be true. Well, the program is true. Uh, the Florida market and the Texas market is actually very good. And how you pretty much uh, determine how the property can pay for itself is you get the appraisal, of course, the valuation of the property, and you also get an idea of what the average rent is in the area. Now, as you know, Tampa, Florida is a very hot market. Tech, certain parts in Texas are very hot market. So they're willing to go at such a high percentage of financing. The reason is because of the market itself and also the increasing in rents and things of that nature. So um, after you, uh, uh, we're going to talk about the process a little bit, but uh, just simple qualifications. It's literally an application, your credit report, and you have your property address and you go on the contract with a 740 FICO. 
It's actually pretty simple. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, later in the slides. Uh, what we also covering uh, is also working capital loans, uh, which have no down payment required. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, how you qualify for this is to make sure your business has good cash flow. And also you have some experience, which at least two years of actually owning the company. Um, and uh, let's see, strong market. Uh, the difference between the market crash in 08, which I spoke about a little bit, versus the pandemic of 2020. All right, so what are some of the key differences? Well, uh, remote work has uh, has caused a, a tremendous ability, a, a tremendous uh, ability for people to just relocate and actually take some of their high salaries, in New York, California, things of that nature, to the Sunshine State, uh, which is actually. Uh, if you speak to a few realtors and uh, a little bit of research, you see the prices starting to drive up. But how you how are people able to afford these properties? Well, with that being said, they're able to do some remote work and take their salaries with them. So uh, also, what's the difference between 08 uh, market crash and also the pandemic? Most homeowners are well qualified in this market. Uh, in the market in 2008, okay, um, I don't want. I want to choose my words wisely. Uh, the uh, if you had a credit score, you can kind of get a mortgage, <laughs> not a 740 FICO, maybe a 580 FICO. There were ways, and there were things that were happening, uh, which actually caused the market to crash. Um, and um, uh, we'll say that maybe most of the pool of the individuals that obtained mortgages uh, were. Uh, it may have slightly been uneducated as far as some of the products they were taken, uh, and some individuals were taken advantage of, unfortunately, uh, which caused a nice little bubble in 08 and caused a huge market crash. But the market today, uh, you, you, when you want to purchase a home, you have to show your income. You got to show the income. And we're going to talk about the difference uh, between showing your income and not showing your income because you're saying, hey, I know you may be wondering, how is there a no-doc product with no income? And yet again, uh, how can that cause an issue in today's market? Well, uh, we're going to talk about the difference as well. But nevertheless, really for the residential mortgage market, individuals, if you want to buy your first home or things of that nature, you got to show your income. All right. And uh, lower rates. Oh, gosh. Uh, the pandemic uh, really pushed the rates down really pushed the rate down and uh, individuals that were still qualified. And it also, it's, it's almost like a domino effect. Uh, individuals were able to go to remote work after they were able, after uh, the pandemic, they were shutting things down and things of that nature, but how companies can still continue. They were wondering, companies were still wondering how they can continue to still make revenue, still make money, still operate and do the things of that nature. So if there was an opportunity to do remote work, that is exactly what they did. And um, what happens is, is that those individuals uh, that continue to work, continue to purchase properties during the pandemic where the very low prices dropped a bit, uh, the rates dropped drastically, which made payments more affordable. So uh, let's talk expectations and we're gonna talk interest rates and loan amounts in a second. Expectations, all right. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit more on the business side for this, okay? We just covered in the previous slide, it's more on the personal side as far as what's happening in today's market. And now we're gonna jump back into what I really specialize in, which is the business side of things. All right, uh, so let's talk paperwork. Uh, you gotta have your paperwork together. All right, uh, now paperwork scares a lot of individuals, scares a lot of individuals, but as Natalia taught, I'm telling you, if you have your, if you keep your, uh, your affairs or your business practices in order, not commingling, not commingling funds, not doing simple things that will raise a lot of questions in underwriting, you'll see that the buying process is, uh, or the buying process or uh, the process for obtaining a loan is really not that difficult. The, number, the second thing you're gonna need is some patience. OK, uh, you're talking about maybe 30 days in the SBA. Uh, they are extremely backlogged with a lot of files and a lot of submissions. So with that being said, uh, it may take a little bit longer, uh, but we're talking about 30 days or less. So you got to know your timeline as well. When do you need the money? That is very huge. So uh, this is a, a rate chart from uh, MortgageNewsDaily.com to kind of show you where uh, the interest rates have been since 1971 
all the way to 2022. And as you can see that peak there, I think it's around 1982-ish. Wow, 17 and a half percent. <laughs> this is residential, by the way. So uh, you can imagine uh, home prices, there's no way home prices could have been 300,000 back then, right? No one can afford that at 17% rate. Pretty sure houses back then were around 50 grand or so. But as you can see, the downward trend over the last couple of decades is quite amazing. And this trend has followed not only in the uh, residential space, um, also in the business lending space as well. So you see a huge downward trend. Remember, we're talking about the opportunity you know, for financing, okay? So uh, these are some of the products. As you can see, these are some of the snapshots from my website, storehousecapitalfs.com. And the first program we're gonna talk about uh, on the business side for individuals who are looking to obtain long-term rentals. Uh, one to four family, uh, Airbnbs, condominiums, townhomes, multifamily, five to 20 units. Uh, loan amounts. Let's talk the loan amounts that you can you can obtain for these. Uh, about a hundred grand, hundred thousand dollar minimum, all the way up to about three million dollars plus. And I tell you, these numbers can actually get very high. Uh, we're not scared of high numbers. We actually like them. Uh, portfolios. Uh, and portfolio loans are simply individuals who have uh, or want to obtain multiple properties uh, or bundle multiple properties, and whether they own them or whether they want to purchase them, uh, we can help them uh, purchase that as a portfolio. Uh, let's talk loan to values, how much you got to put down versus how much you got to finance. Uh, loan to values, 80% uh, of Florida and Texas is a little bit, a little bit higher these days. Uh, due to its strong market, but generally like to stay around the 80% mark. So I would expect to always have at least 20% injection, you know, for, uh, for the uh, type of property that you're looking to obtain. Uh, no doc uh, DSCR debt service coverage ratio must be greater than one. But what that means is, is that the mortgage payments two grand, the rent got to be two grand or better. Okay, so we talked a little bit earlier about the average rent, uh, the average rent in the area, if that falls below uh, the, for example, that we just use, if your mortgage payment is 2000, the average rent is 1900. Remember, it's a no doc, there's no extra income to kind of support and say, hey, listen, I'll make up the difference. So what happens there? What happens is you got to come down with a little bit more money. You got to get that payment down. You got to uh, uh, put some more equity in, more equity injection in, uh, more of a down payment to kind of get that debt service coverage to where it needs to be. Uh, another thing we uh, do cover, and I'm just going to touch and kind of skim through this, um, and this is really for uh, the individual that is looking for a charismatic type of deal, something that has a little hair on it, um, that, uh, you know, lenders, uh, if you walk into Chase, they're just going to say, no, that's really not going to work out. We have programs for that. Uh, and those loan amounts go for about $200,000 uh, minimum to about 50 million plus. Uh, and what are those used for? Land, uh, multifamilies that may be distressed, uh, uh, retail, hotels, uh, office, industrial, or even mixed-use property, uh, mixed-use properties. There's no minimum FICO. Uh, the reason why we say this uh, and um, uh, is simply because it is private money. So the main driving factor they're looking at is actual piece of real estate that's attached to the deal. So to give you an example, you have a piece of real estate, it's a million dollars. Uh, your credit, you know, is, uh, you, you let's say you went through the pandemic, something happened, you know, your credit, you had to max out your credit cards, you know, you fell behind on some things, but you got this piece of real estate, it's a million dollars, you know, it's nearly paid off, things of that nature. You can borrow up to maybe 750,000, maybe half a million, 750,000, uh, depending on your FICO. Okay, and it will actually be, a, and they will actually uh, lend you the money depending on how much the building or uh, that property will appraise for. Okay, so the risk really here is how much are they willing to loan you, uh, how much risk they're willing to take with also padding themselves for an exit if you are not able to recover and they have to get rid of, they have to get rid of the, uh, they have to get rid of the real estate in a pinch. All right, and also this is a good program that they fund, uh, uh, we can fund in the US and also internationally. 
All right, so uh, now we're gonna kind of get into the meat of what I usually see daily, uh, which is SBA loans ranging from 25,000 to 5 million uh, terms for up to about 25 years. Uh, and these funds can be used for expansion, acquisition, refinancing debts, uh, working capital, uh, purchase inventory, and more. Now, uh, with SBA loans, uh, those loans uh, are story driven. Okay, you got to have a good story. You got to tell them exactly what you want to use the money for. Why did? Why do you want to borrow this money? And now, SBA loans, they automatically think government. Now. Banks actually give the SBA loans. So you're actually financing the money through the bank. And the bank is actually uh, uh, guaranteeing the loan through the SBA, okay? So now you can, uh, for loans ranging between 25,000 up to about 350,000, there's a small sweet spot there because the personal guarantees and things of that nature are not as extensive as when you borrow $350,000 or more. Some people say it's an XBA Express, but it's really just called a small a small 7A loan. And those loans are underwritten a little bit differently. And those are the loans we're actually seeing uh, uh, you know, pretty good turnaround on. Uh, what I mean by turnaround, about 30 days or less. I have someone actually applying today, uh, sent them the application. Uh, they're looking for about $350,000. Now, uh, when you go above 350,000, things begin to change. They start to ask for collateral. They start to ask for a couple of more things, you know, uh, uh, to make sure that you're able to support the loan or in case there's a default. So the second program uh, that we're seeing a lot is commercial mortgages. Uh, commercial real estate still being bought up at a very high rate. Uh, loan amounts from 100,000 to about $35 million plus. Uh, debt service coverage ratios we talked about. As you can see, that number is a little bit up from the 1.0 on a uh, uh, one to four family rental. Uh, what that means is, is, is that uh, if, our, if we're giving you a loan and your payment's a thousand bucks and you're at a 1.2 debt service coverage ratio, we wanna make sure that you can afford 1200 bucks so that you pad yourself in case, that, in case there's an issue. And uh, those numbers change depending on uh, the type of property that you're looking to obtain. So if it's an office building or apartment complex, things of that nature, the debt service coverage ratios qualification will change. Uh, good for commercial mortgages, multifamily, mixed use, warehouse, self-storage, offices, light industrial, automotive. Great. Uh, third, term loans. Term loan, this term loan here is actually great. It's a good sweet spot for the individuals who can't really qualify for SBA loans. And we're gonna talk about some of the qualifications in a bit, but I'll talk about it. Uh, I'll kind of touch on it now. For an SBA, uh, you're going to have to prove to the bank that you're actually cash flowing. And what that means is, is that you have a surplus after you pay all your bills and your expenses, so on and so forth. And that cash flow shows us exactly how much more debt the business can take on. If the business is not, uh, if you're writing off a lot, unfortunately, uh, if you're showing a negative cash flow or uh, whatever it is, unfortunately, to, lend, to the lender's perspective or the lender's lens, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the business is not able to take on new debt, unfortunately. Okay, so what does that mean from a tax perspective? Now, not by all means, I, I don't do taxes. I don't even do my own taxes. I sent it out to the accountant because I don't want to miss anything, okay, which is a wise thing to do. But I will tell you that I've uh, seen a lot of tax returns and um, people don't like to pay taxes for some reason. I mean, I don't like to pay taxes, but unfortunately, if you're paying taxes, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Why do I say that? The reason is, is because it's showing that your company's profiting and you want to show your company's profiting to a bank, okay, in order to obtain an SBA loan. Now, what happens if uh, last two years, your company is, if you're doing well, you're doing okay, you don't have enough to borrow what you need from the SBA, is there another market for you? Absolutely. Okay, so we have a certain term loan. It doesn't go as high as 5 million, but it does go up to about five years that can range from 25,000 to 200,000. 
Uh, it's a five-year term loan, so monthly payments. Uh, your existing debt balances do not need to be paid off, which means that if you do have existing debt, we're going to somewhat ignore it to an extent so that you're able to get the capital that you need. Uh, it will actually, it's a good loan for individuals who are looking to increase their business credit profile uh, with Dun & Bradstreet, okay? It's a great thing to know, a great thing to do for your business is to increase that credit profile because it will actually help you for an SBA loan later, okay? Uh, there's no upfront cost or origination fees and no restrictions on the use of funds. Now, I, that is highlighted there because for the SBA, you have to really understand where the funds are going. And there's, it's gonna, you're gonna have to give a detailed summary as far as to what you're looking to use the funds for with the SBA versus the term loan. Can I punch the next slide for me? Okay, preparing for the best outcome. Okay, we talked about it a little earlier. Get your paperwork in order. Um, what did I see during the pandemic? During the pandemic, a lot of individuals came to me to, uh, to guide them to uh, apply for PPP loans, okay? And uh, what I saw and what was pretty devastating is, is that the capital was there. I mean, maybe first go around, it was a little, little tricky. It was a long line. But once the capital came available and they kind of started to level out and the process became a little bit more seamless, what we begin to find out is, is that a lot of individuals haven't done their taxes in a year, two, three years. So unfortunately, a lot of those people missed out on the uh, government giving out the PPP money. Okay, what does that mean? So uh, a lot of the numbers on the PPP were predicated if you were let's say a Schedule C or a, uh, an LLC that filtered your business and it flowed through your personal tax return, you file the Schedule C. If you file the Schedule C, they're taking that bottom number, doing a little multiplier, and that's how much you are getting. That's how much what they, that's the metrics or the matrix they use to determine how much of a PPP loan you will get. Uh, well, if you didn't file your taxes, how are they gonna use that formula? So uh, a lot of individuals who were just backlogged two, three years back in, uh, from doing their taxes could not get PPP loans and could not do it. And guess what? There's no government, no SBA lending uh, uh, available, unfortunately, uh, for individuals that did not have their paperwork in order. So you do want to have your paperwork up to date when you're looking to obtain uh, long-term financing. By long-term, I mean SBA, I mean uh, commercial mortgages and things of that nature, okay? Uh, that includes your tax returns, your, your profit and loss, which has to usually be within 60 days, okay? I know people do it quarterly, things of that nature. I would like to see it within 60 days, preferably 30 if you can, if you really meet with your account once a month. Uh, balance sheets definitely showing, uh, you know, what's going out, what do you have, or how much is the, how, you know, uh, what's the stress of the business, trying to see, trying to uh, figure out uh, where the business is and where the business stands with all its debt and all its assets. All right, uh, some tips, work on your weak areas, collections, judgments, any negative history that may show its head during the financing process. Uh, I can tell you that, um, I'll give you a, uh, a, a little testimony about a deal that I did. Uh, I did a deal for an individual in uh, North Carolina, uh, a very fine fur company. They actually clean and preserve fur coats, okay? And uh, they were requesting about a million six. They were trying to buy a bigger building to leave a place where they were renting, and they were trying to, uh, trying to uh, move their business over to this new building. Well, uh, we got deep into the loan process, come to find out they had about over $150,000 in tax liens that they didn't tell me about. <laughs> You'd think that, and I'm going to kind of jump to the last one and jump back to the second one, to be honest with your loan officer, okay? Listen, uh, we funded people with convictions, prior convictions, okay? Uh, we funded individuals who've had tax issues, which brings me back to the second one, uh, uh, the collections, judgments, any negative history. Uh, if you let us know about it, there's ways to work around it, okay? Uh, what we did was it kind of stumped the, and it, it's best if we present it, then the underwriter finds out because lending, like I said, you got to tell the story. And once your loan gets in front of an underwriter and the underwriter starts to not like the story, 
uh, they start to get an un they start to get uncomfortable, and that stamp of approval starts to weaken uh, more and more as the days go by. So if we know about it and we can tackle it, and you're honest with your loan officer, you'll actually end up with the best outcome. Jump. Okay. All right. The logistics, uh, the business loan process. So what does it look like? To me, uh, these three, these three uh, uh, little segments here, these three little bullet points are very important. The last one is going to be talking about the process, which is why it's a little more detailed. But the main thing is your why. Why do you need to borrow money? Okay. Um, I will tell you that banks don't like to see that you're in trouble and you want to bail yourself out. Okay. Uh, now there's other programs available, uh, but if you want the best loan in the market, you want the lowest rates, you want the monthly payments, you want uh, to make sure that uh, you're not taking capital that's so front loaded with a lot of uh, interest, uh, what you want to do is to understand your why, okay? Why do you need to borrow money? Uh, it should always be geared towards growth. So when I talk to individuals, I do kind of coach them and tell them if you need to borrow money, Make sure within your summary. Make sure within your summary that it is geared towards uh, towards some type of growth. Okay, some type of major need that the company is looking for. All right, uh, some may need funds for a breather, uh, and there are ways that we can work that. But necessarily, as we spoke about before, that is not the lender's appetites. They're really looking to see an upward trend for your company. And what does an upward trend look like? Your revenue in 2018 was 150 grand, 2019, 175, 2020, 200, but a lot of people in 2020 probably dipped a little bit. Uh, so when we get the profit and loss and we start to see, okay, uh, maybe there were some employees, you let some employees go, you kind of tried to do your best to make sure that your, your bottom line is somewhat similar to the prior years uh, for 2020, that we call that the exception year. So that may look a little weird for, uh, depending on the uh, business type, because there are actually some companies that thrive during the pandemic. Uh, with nevertheless, uh, they want to see the upward trend. They want to see you year over year that your company is continuing to grow. Okay, you say, well, if my company is growing, why do I need to borrow money? Because you never want to use your own. <laughs> you never want to leverage your own assets if you don't have to. If you have to use someone else's money, please do so by any means necessary. Okay, not all lenders are the same. Some like hotels, some like car washes, some like multifamily, some like uh, uh, daycares. You know, it depends on the business type. Not, and not every single loan is one lender's appetite. Okay, uh, and where I come in is to, once I learn about your story and what's your purpose and your why, I can always point you in the right direction. Uh, that is one major reason why I named the company Storehouse Capital is because once I understand what you're looking for, I'm actually able to kind of guide you and put you in the right direction for the proper financing. Because usually if you're looking to borrow money, you already have a picture in your mind exactly what you want. And most of the time, your heart breaks because that's not what you qualify for or that's not necessarily what you're ready for yet. Or there's a better loan opportunity out there for you that you didn't know about. So uh, what is the, uh, the, the full logistics of the uh, business loan process look like? Submit your paperwork, okay? Paperwork comes to me on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's say you submit your paperwork, you give me your tax returns application. I review your tax, uh, the paperwork is, re is reviewed by the LO, which is a loan officer, which, which would be myself. Uh, after I review the paperwork, additional docs may be needed. So I'll let you know before we put this loan in the processing, is there anything else that we can plug in? Uh, we'll scrub the file to make sure it's presented to the bank in the best manner possible. And I do want to kind of stress uh, the presentation to the lender. Again, your, your why is very important, but also a clean package and a clear, concise understanding of what you're looking to do paperwork in order, uh, not pages missing, not a, uh, a, a, a very light tax return. I've gotten tax returns, it's just three pages. And I say, hey, you know, um, that's really not the appetite of the lender. They actually want to see your full scope, see what's going on with you. So uh, packaging the deal is, is huge in your presentation, okay? A letter of intent or a pre-approval is issued. 
okay? Uh, down payments may be needed depending on the deal. Example, appraisal freeze, inspections, good faith deposits. Very important that when you're entering into the lending process, depending on what you're looking to buy, if it's a piece of real estate, or if you're just looking for just a working capital loan, depending on the loan type, you can expect the lender to ask you to put some skin in the game, okay? They may ask you to say, hey, listen, we want a good faith deposit of $10,000. Uh, well, well, you wanna know where that money's being used for. In a perfect scenario, I closed a deal in Alabama who are for a cabinet com uh, company in 2020, and uh, they had to put a good faith deposit of 5,000 and ending up having to put another good faith deposit of another $5,000 uh, for inspections, for environmentals, for appraisals. And environmentals are simply just an inspection of the property to make sure that it's environmentally sound, okay? So if there's like any poor uh, leakage or waste or something that is not, that can actually cause damage to the building or anything that can prohibit the business from operating at its optimum level, they're going to require some type of uh, phase one or a phase two where they'll have to come back and say, what kind of amendments or what have you done to this property to make sure that these environmental issues are addressed? Okay. And that costs money. So your good faith deposit will cover the, a lot of those uh, requests. So um, afterwards, uh, you'll get a loan approval. Okay, and then you'll actually have uh, loan conditions, uh, which we're going to have to meet. And uh, usually we're just plugging and playing at that point. Once you get a loan approval, the bank is actually happy with the deal that they got. Okay, uh, is really not much to worry about aside from the fact that you do have to get insurance. Okay, which Natalia talked about, making sure you have a good insurance broker. If you're looking to borrow money or you're a business owner, entrepreneur, whatever it is, you should have a good connection with a business, uh, a insurance broker. Okay. Um, a couple other things you may see is uh, maybe some title work. Okay, making sure the property is free and clear. Um, and you just plug in, let any letters of explanation that we need to get for an open item that they want to do. And we're just plugging in playing so that we can get the most famous saying and one of the most uh, happiest phone calls that I love to make, which is clear to close. Okay, clear to close. And that is all I got. That is all I got. This is my information. Um, cell phone number is there. Uh, email is there. We're on Facebook and we're also on LinkedIn as well. And uh, I'd love to connect with everybody uh, and anybody that's interested. And I'm also available just for simple consultations uh, to kind of talk through uh, anything I talked about today, or even if you're interested uh, in, uh, in obtaining any other type of business loan that we have. Thank you. Thank you. They're working. Yep, perfect. Ooh, the inception yeah, screen. I was gonna say, let's get rid of that. <laughs> well, you still got the other part of mine, so. Oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Here you were. Back to the inception screen. Back to the inception screen. <clears throat> All you have to just pull up the other one. Yeah, I'll assist. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I had my little transitional intermission thing. Okay, I loved your presentation because it, it really, we need to prepare for when we're going to ask for financing because it really is a stepping stone for growth for owning a business. Um, and understanding 
what we need to have in order is a perfect transition into this next part that I'm going to cover, which is about taxes and in part how your financials play into your taxes. So first I have this <clears throat> taxes. It's part of being successful. I thought this was an amusing little meme, but yeah, when you are a successful business owner, you are going to have to pay your taxes. That is just the reality. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some of those mistakes that business owners make when it comes to taxes. <clears throat> All right. So first mistake that I see, and it happens fairly frequently, is that people business owners decide to do their own bookkeeping. And so the statement that I get is, oh yeah, I do, I do my own business books. Yeah, I like, I, I do my numbers, I prepare all of that. But as you can see, when you are a business owner, you're probably quite busy working in your business, especially if you haven't hired staff yet. And when you're working in your business, you don't often have the time to work on your business, including your business financials, and then you end up not having things done properly and on time. And like Michael said, that's gonna create an issue for you to be able to get financing. It's also gonna create an issue in terms of preparing your taxes, right? And preparing to file your tax return and predicting your taxes. So doing your own bookkeeping is a big mistake that I see small business owners make. And Again, not just because of financing, but think about how much of your time it's taking to do your business books. Now, unless you have a degree in accounting, you've been trained as a bookkeeper, you know how to do accounting and finance and look at that, um, your statements and what's coming in and what's going out and how to track it properly, you're probably going to be taking a lot more time doing this than a bookkeeper will. And then as far as your time goes, right? How much is one hour of your time worth actually hustling in your business, marketing, selling, whatever it is that you produce, right? How much of your time is worth doing an hour of that versus doing an hour of bookkeeping? And I can guarantee that bookkeeping for your month of what's coming in and going out is not gonna take you an hour. It's gonna take way more than an hour. <laughs> but it's going to take a properly trained bookkeeper far less time than you to do it. So get this off your plate right now. Get rid of that horrible tax mistake and have a bookkeeper, hire a bookkeeper. It is not as expensive as you think, and it will take a massive weight off of you. And it'll make your CPA really happy. It'll make your lenders really happy because you'll have a professional dealing with your numbers. Tax mistake number two. A missed opportunity, not examining your financial statements regularly, right? And when I say regularly, I mean monthly and quarterly. You need to be examining your profit and loss. This is born from the communications that I have with my clients when they say, I'm afraid to look at my books. Don't be ashamed in this. I, I mean, I belong to a community of about 90,000 lawyers in the United States that very often, at least once a week, there's a post from an attorney who runs her own business saying, I'm terrified to look at my books. So if that's coming from the mouths of an attorney, think about how frequent of a feeling this is in the business owner community, small business owner community, and why? Why are people afraid to look at their books? Because you don't necessarily have any training in examining your books, right? You don't know what a profit and loss statement should contain. A statement of cash flows, a balance sheet, what's an asset, what's a liability, right? So it's important as a business owner to educate yourself a bit on what these mean so that you can, as part of what your bookkeeper produces, start looking at these, getting comfortable with the numbers and, and what they say about your business. But also if it's something that's really difficult for you to understand and wrap your head around, hire somebody to examine these for you, right? Get a, a financial advisor to examine these and say, okay, it looks like 
your business is okay, or you're hemorrhaging here, or this type of service that you provide isn't really profitable for your business, but this other one that you've got here, that's where you need to be making your emphasis. So that's something really important about looking at your books. It's going to tell you where you should be focusing because your business is going to differ from that competitor and that competitor in the sense that product A or service A is really profitable for you and product B might be terrible for you. It just doesn't match up with what you do very well. And that way you can go, okay, you know, my business focus is going to be here because focusing here on A is going to help me grow. And so that's one of the big I call it a tax mistake, right? Because financial statements go to the heart of the conversations that you're having with your CPA. <clears throat> what are you doing there? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so that is one of the big things. So hire somebody for that. Looking at your financials is also going to help you catch when there's business theft, business misappropriation of funds by employees in addition to that business hemorrhaging I was talking about. If you don't look at your financials, you are making it that much easier for anybody that works for you to slowly drip off funds or quickly drip off funds from your accounts. And they're going to take advantage of an uninformed business owner. So don't put yourself in that position. All right, another mistake, missed opportunity relating to taxes. And this is not paying your estimated taxes. This goes to you individually as a business owner and as far as the business, okay? It depends on how your tax structure is for your business, whether you're treated fully as a pass-through entity or your business does have separate business taxes that it owes if it's taxed as a C corporation. When you have a business and you're examining those financials, you can get an idea of is, you know, like how much income does it look like? How much profit does it look like we're going to be making based on our revenues and our expenses that come in, right? If you don't pay your estimated taxes, you're going to put yourself in a very precarious situation of having to pay penalties because the Internal Revenue Service will impose penalties if you owe taxes and you haven't at least prepaid to a certain level of cushioning for your individual taxes and for your business taxes. And not only do they have prepayment penalties, they have interest on those penalties. And the interest start out at the federal short-term rate plus three percentage points if it's under $100,000 in taxes owed if it's over that, it's even higher. So it's not cheap to not pay estimated taxes. That's why it's important to examine your financials and to have regular communications with your CPA and your bookkeeper, right? You don't want to be that person that's making the statement of, I don't, I don't know what I'll owe. I have no idea what I'm going to owe. And so I don't know what to do. You, you need to surround yourself with the right mentors to help you go, this is what you need to know. And so this is what you need to do. Somebody that's going to provide you with those vouchers, teach you, hey, here's how you remit those estimated returns so that at the end of the year, you're not hit with a penalty. And even if you have a small tax bill at the end, it's gonna be small enough that you're not going to be penalized for it, right? So that is a missed opportunity because if you're not making sufficient prepaid estimated taxes in advance, you're making it more expensive for your business and for yourself without like any need to do so. So that's a big mistake that I see. And that happens very often with people that don't file their tax returns every year, right? Their business tax returns, their personal tax returns, they get hit up with these penalties. And, and when I'm doing title searches and I see these IRS liens that get recorded, I go, ooh, there's a person who is afraid to look at their financials and afraid to submit those tax returns. So you've got to overcome that fear as a business owner and just sit down, get familiar, get comfortable being uncomfortable and submit things ahead of time so that you're not hit with penalties and interest. 
Next, okay, another missed opportunity mistake business owners make is they don't meet with their CPA quarterly. You don't have to meet with your CPA monthly. You should definitely meet with your bookkeeper at least monthly, but not with your CPA. You don't like, there's different things that they do. Your bookkeeper is going to be accounting for things, what's coming in, what's going out, all of that. Your CPA is your tax advisor for purposes of planning at a more intense strategic level. So here's a statement that I get from business owners that come to meet me, the same people that go, I want to create an LLC. They also go, I don't have a CPA. <laughs> if you don't have somebody that can advise you as to the tax opportunities and tax strategies for your business, you are creating a big gaping hole for your business, right? Your CPA is going to educate you on not just changes in the tax law, but they're going to help you plan around existing and prospective tax law changes that are coming up so that you are not only minimizing your tax burden, but taking advantage of different like tax programs available so that your business can grow. So it's really important to have these meetings and to not wait until the very end of the year or the beginning of the next year, because by then it's too late. You can't change the behavior that you had for that year. But during the year of tax activity, having those conversations is going to let you adjust what you need to do in your business to make it the best possible tax consequence at the end of that year for you and for your business. So you are going to take your bookkeeper financials when you do this right, when you don't miss this opportunity and you're gonna take them to your CPA. You're gonna look at that quarterly report and you're gonna say, look, it looks like we're trending upward this way. What should I do? What kind of remittances can I do? Maybe, am I missing some deductions in my business that I could be taking advantage of? Or maybe there's just quite a bit of profit here and does this mean that I have an opportunity to invest in something? Or maybe now I have the appropriate cash flow to take that loan that I wanted to have to grow to the next level, to buy that building instead of paying rent, et cetera, right? And your CPA is a great person to have that conversation with. Your CPA is also gonna help you identify how to classify your expenses so that you maximize deductions. Because if you don't have those conversations with your CPA, you're going to be having those conversations with the wrong people. You're going to be having your conversations with your neighbor, with your friend from down the street, with your cousin, and none of them are going to be qualified to have that conversation with you. So don't, don't be poorly advised just because it might be embarrassing or a little difficult to bring up with a professional it's, it's okay, they see this all day long, but get the advice from the person that is qualified to give you the advice, please. So make sure that you're meeting with your CPA regularly. Your next missed opportunity that I see uh, business owners have is that they just go with a default tax status. They create their entity and they're like, hey, I just created this LLC and uh, I didn't do anything else. Okay, so you didn't, you didn't talk about tax election status? Because here's the thing, an LLC is not a tax election status. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. You have, an LLC is just, a, it's just like a shell for the IRS. It's just like a shell. And if you're a single member in an LLC, it's just going to pass through to you. That's going to be the default. It's going to be as if it was you. Just you, like a sole proprietorship. If you've got partners, if you've got more than two owners, it's going to default to partnership taxation, which is quite complex. And I would never recommend a person try to do partnership taxes themselves. Never. <clears throat> if you are an LLC, that's it. Those are the defaults, right? Neither one of them is the best option. So why put yourself through that? That's a tax thing that you're missing out on. And I'll give you an example. So let's say you um, are a single member LLC owner. If you choose to, for example, make an S election, so be 
tax as an S corporation. Well, now you have the ability of limiting what those self-employment taxes are going to hit because otherwise those self-employment taxes are gonna hit everything as a sole proprietorship. That's 15.6% tax right there on all of it, right? Whereas if you do an S election, you get to set a specific amount of wages and all it needs to be is just reasonable wages for what you do. And that would get hit with a 15 point, you know, whatever percent tax. And then only profits get taxed at a different rate, which is almost always lower than that percent, right? So why do that to yourself as a business owner? Why go with the default? Some people would benefit from being taxed as a C corporation. And why? Because maybe they want to attract venture capital. They want to attract other investors, right? So being taxed as a C corporation is going to open up different opportunities where you've just got investors that are going to get dividends, right? As opposed to you as the owner of a different kind of stock getting taxed a little bit differently and then getting paid as wages. And so there's lots of ways in which a CPA can advise you as to, depending on where you want your business to go and what kind of business it is, the kind of growth and minimization of tax burden that you can have by simply not being the default. <clears throat> and also, if you go with a pass-through, you're more likely to invite audits there's just that part of being in the schedules of a 1040 tax return as opposed to having a separate 1120S or you know the tax return for C corporations. It just, that's how it is. They invite audits. <laughs> so there's a benefit to not choosing the default there. All right, so other missed opportunities when it comes to taxes, ignoring deductions. Another statement I hear at these consultations, I thought my business couldn't pay for that. There's a lot of business owners that are not aware of what is tax deductible and what isn't tax deductible. To give you an idea for loans, okay? What you're making as a payment on a loan with your business isn't fully tax deductible. The interest portion of your payment is tax deductible but not the principal. And those are things that you don't know until you know, right? So these conversations are important to have with your CPA about what is deductible, what isn't deductible. Other things that are tax deductible, legal services. Part of your estate planning as a business owner is tax deductible to the extent that it deals with business succession questions. Were you aware of that? Obviously, any legal expenses that relate to, you know, if you're an investor of real estate that's rentals, right? Anything you pay for evictions, collections, et cetera, that's all going to be tax deductible to your business. Um, health insurance is tax deductible. Even the part of the premium that gets paid by your business as a business owner for you that becomes tax deductible. There's a special way in which it's treated in your tax return, but it is fully tax deductible. <clears throat> coaching. Coaching is a very popular thing nowadays, right? More and more of us are realizing, hey, we need mentoring in this area and that area. I need to grow in this area. And like, I'm having a block. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do in sales. I don't know what to do in marketing. I don't know what to do in financial. Coaching, so long as it is for the purpose of growing your business, is a deductible business expense. So just because you benefit from it by growing as a, as a human being doesn't mean it's not tax deductible because it really will make your business grow, right? Learning how to do sales properly, learning how to do marketing properly, learning how to run finances, all of that is for your business. Vehicles, right? Some people, depending your vehicle lease, can be deductible in your taxes as part of your business, right? Um, networking expenses, those are tax deductible. So if you're going out 
to, let's say you're talking with a group of other investors, you guys go out to lunch. You're talking about business opportunities. That is a tax deductible lunch, right? You have to focus on business, but it doesn't mean you can't talk about other things that are, you know, normal human conversation, but those things are also tax deductible. So please have a conversation with your CPA, get a deep understanding of what is tax deductible and what isn't so that you are minimizing your tax burden and really taking advantage of your business as a way to not only grow the business, but to grow yourself. Um, because if you grow up here, your business is going to grow too. Other tax mistakes and missed opportunities that I see is that people ignore death and give taxes. They don't know what they don't know there, but here's the thing. Transferring assets can trigger taxes. They can trigger tax consequences. So if you have business A and you have business B, and you transfer an asset from business A to business B, that is a tax consequence activity. The same way that if you transfer your property from you to your grown child, that is a tax consequence event. You know, one potentially tr triggers some income taxes, some changes of basis in the companies, right? Changes in the value of the companies too. The other one is triggering gift tax consequences. And any, any transaction in which you transfer an asset or give somebody something more valuable than $16,000 in any particular year is gonna trigger a gift tax. So you've gotta make sure that you're paying attention and depending on how much is transferred, the value of that transfer, that can be anywhere between 18 and 40% tax hit on that. Anything over the value of what's exempt. That's a lot. That's significant. So you've got to be planning for these gift tax consequences and transfer tax consequences. One of the big mistakes that I see here is people will, business owners, and I see this as real estate investors. So they they quit claim property A from company A and they give it to company B and they don't pay any documentary stamp taxes on it, right? Because they're trying to avoid the sales tax of the transfer because that's a transfer and it triggers a sales tax in the state of Florida. And if company B has any other owners that are different from company A, you've got a tax consequence. And if you don't pay the value of the transfer, now you are gonna get hit with a up to three times penalty. So if that property transfer was $100,000 with an assessment of you know the doc stamps on a $100,000 worth of transfer, and now instead of paying 700 bucks, you're gonna pay three times that, 2,100 bucks to the state of Florida. And they are looking. They do look. Heck, they look at transfers that happen between spouses. <laughs> they'll do, they'll come back and go after spouses because they don't have the same last name and they're not sure if this is a transfer between spouses or not. So it's important that you are taking into account the effect of transfer taxes and gift taxes. And then the cost of you passing away is state taxes on your beneficiaries and on your business partners. Right now we have what like the highest estate tax exemption that we've seen federally, right? If you die this year, up to 12 million of your assets as an individual are exempt from taxation. Anything over that, then you're looking at a graduated tax rate that can go up to 40 to 45% of your taxable estate, anything over 12 million. If you're a real estate investor, it's really easy to very quickly get to around that amount. All you need is about 10 properties, right? You can have 10 pieces of commercial real estate, bam. You're at right around that amount. Especially with the way that values are, are taking place right now, the average home value, just an average home, 
is about $300,000, $340,000 in Tampa today, right? For a small two, three, 1,400 square foot house. <laughs> I know it's painful. <laughs> I see that look. Um, and so we need to think about the consequences of the value of assets going up and this tax exemption sunsets. This is gonna go down to half. Actually, it's gonna go down to 5 million and then adjusted for inflation on January 1st, 2026. So soon, this tax exemption isn't going to be 12 million. It's just, it's set to sunset. That's how it was written into the law in 2017 when it, the tax code changed. And so think about how quickly as a real estate investor, you are likely to get hit with the consequences of not doing proper estate planning that minimizes the tax burden to your heirs and to your business partners, right? Because if you pass away and you've got business partners, and you haven't planned for that tax consequence and you haven't decided how your business is gonna be valued, oh God, your, your business partner who may have under the plan been encouraged to buy out the interest that, so that your family isn't part of that business, now they might be hit with a really weird tax consequence or your Loved ones might be hit with a really weird tax consequence, something that they can't fund because they don't have the money because it's not liquid assets, right? Especially if you're a real estate investor. It's likely not liquid assets, but it's still valued that way. And that's all the IRS cares about. <laughs> so it's really important to do tax planning, estate tax planning, gift tax planning, and transfer tax planning as part of being a business owner. The last thing that I wanted to mention is, you know, I'm talking here in the state of Florida and in the state of Florida, we do not have state to state taxes, but that does not mean that other states are like that. Very few states don't have state to state taxes. If you have any other investments, any other assets in a state that does have state to state taxes, they don't have that beautiful federal exemption of 12 million their state estate taxes get triggered at a much earlier rate. Some only a million, some a couple million, some in the hundreds of thousands, which puts a lot of us in that bag. So remember that when you're thinking about your tax strategy as a business owner, you need to think about where you have assets as well. All right, so <clears throat> If you have spotted holes in your business today, right? In either the presentations that I have made or the presentations that Michael has made in terms of financial and getting a loan and being organized for being able to get a business loan in tax matters and in insurance and in legal questions, you should consult with us and you should definitely consult with Michael because we can assist you in closing up those holes so that your business grows and doesn't shrink and shut down, it doesn't get sued in a way that's going to render it incapable of acting. It's not going to be incapacitated as a business because you got hit by a car. It's not going to put your family at a situation where they're not going to be able to buy out or get paid for the value of your interest in a business if something happens to you, right? And so a little bit about my business here, LCO Law, we uh, established a law firm back in 2011. We've helped hundreds of real estate investors with their uh, litigation and real estate litigation, business planning and estate planning. <clears throat> I, uh, I have a Juris Doctorate from Setson University from back in 2009. I also have an MBA from the University of South Florida and my focus was on finance. And so I'm a big math nerd. I'm not afraid of numbers. I'll help you look at numbers. <laughs> um, my team is trained in treating our clients with a concierge kind of uh, treatment. And so we're very big on communication and helping people feel comfortable in all aspects of their transactions, whether it's litigation or planning. <clears throat> we have a 
large group of professional referral partners. And that's why we regularly invite other business professionals to speak at these seminars because we know that we don't have all the information. We know that it's really important for you all in the business owning community to get information from the correct sources. And so, for example, for business lending purposes, for getting your business to grow through that vehicle, speaking with Michael is an excellent idea. And if you are not sure about Michael's information, maybe you didn't see it, maybe it went a little too fast, we would be happy to get you Michael's information. Um, our website is lcolawfl.com. Pretty easy. Just think of it as the taking charge of your legacy. That's why our icon is a bull, taking charge of your legacy. And the L legacy is your business. It's your estate. It's your assets. It's your family. Um, we also do regularly scheduled appointments through Calendly. So calendly.com forward slash lcolaw makes it really easy in this era to schedule an appointment with us. And I want to thank you all for attending and we will be posting this online. It will be in our YouTube channel. It'll also be available through Michael's company. He'll let everybody know how he's gonna post that up when it is available. It'll be up probably in about a week. All right, thank you very much and good night, everybody. <clears throat> Inception.